Suleiman. I'm a student at Al-Aqsa University in Gaza and an activist with the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions movement. And I'm the coordinator of the Palestinian Student Campaign for the Academic Boycott of Israel. I will tell you my experiences as a Palestinian refugee in Gaza, particularly those during the last major Israeli attack in 2014. The suffering caused by the barbaric siege on Gaza, which began in 2017, has only got worse. To the extent that Gaza is now considered to be the world's largest open-air prison. The effect of the siege was exacerbated by three severe attacks in 2008 and 9, 2012 and the bloodiest and most brutal assault in 2014. I can't describe anything we witnessed during the war, what we experienced and what we saw cannot be, cannot be adequately complained in words. The only way I can describe it is genocide. Customer complaints about this. We understand. Nobody can deny that we were all close to death. In fact, I felt that death was inevitable. All of Gaza was surrounded for over 50 days, from the east by tanks, from the west by gunboats, and above us there were dozens of drones and many warplanes. There was no shelter. Every place and every person was a target. We all lost relatives, friends and neighbours. There were 45 students from my university alone who were killed. The first thing that comes to my mind when I remember them is that I was supposed to be one of them. As a student, I was so severely affected psychologically that I was not prepared to go back to university after that brutal war. After witnessing the massacres that Israel committed, I was not prepared to continue my life as normal, as if nothing had happened. I lived in shock for such a long time that I couldn't believe I was still alive. In spite of it all, I did go back to university. We do continue with our lives. We were all still steadfast. Despite all the miseries we faced, I as a student was so affected by the war that my will and persistence became stronger. I will not spend my life doing nothing. I will try to resist by whatever means I can. And the way I can resist is by boycotting Israel. This started gradually, until I was convinced that I had to avoid buying any Israeli products. Otherwise, I will be paying Israeli forces for the price of killing more than 2,000 innocent people. I cannot find any justification for dealing with or buying Israeli products, or from any company that supports them, such as Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard are complicit in Israel's violations of international law and human rights. These words are not enough to conclude my experience, but I have tried to describe the things that affected me most and explain why I have joined the movement for boycott, divestment and sanctions. Boycott, divestment and sanctions is peaceful resistance that demands justice, equality and freedom which are against Israel's aims and goals. My name is Haidar and I'm a professor at Al-Aqsa University in Gaza. I have witnessed three huge massacres committed by apartheid Israel, almost lost my life more than once lost very close comrades, colleagues, relatives and students. I have lived through an indescribable ongoing trauma and seen horror beyond my words. I have been prevented from attending my parents' funerals, deprived of seeing my sister and nephews who live in Bethlehem, just a one hour drive away, for more than 16 years. And I've been without a reliable source of electricity and clean water since 2006. I have seen the Bakker children slaughtered 
in broad daylight on a Gaza beach, and I have read with agony the names of 66 families that were totally wiped out by Israeli weapons and deleted from the civic registry. I had to consciously fight against the possibility of becoming just a number in news reports on CNN, BBC and Sky News. 2,200 people, including 551 children, were not that lucky in 2014. Nor were 1,200, including 443 children in 2009, or 200 in 2012. The Israeli war machine and the deafening international silence took their lives. Hewlett Packard provide IT for the Israeli Navy who enforced the naval blockade of Gaza, signed the pledge to boycott HP. My name is Intamar and I'm a student from Gaza. During the last war on Gaza in 2014, I was in the United States finishing my master's degree. I heard the news that Gaza was being wiped out by Israel. Absolute destruction was taking place at the hands of a military that does not obey international law. I tried calling my mother and siblings, but there was no response. Later on, my uncle answered his phone. We are alive, he said. There was heavy, heavy bombing tonight. We didn't sleep. We have to evacuate the house, the whole area. I ask, evacuate to where? To nowhere. At that moment, I decided to go back to Gaza. So I traveled to Jordan, intending to head on to Egypt, and then on to Gaza. But it did not happen, and I was stuck in Jordan. I called my mum, telling her I'm trying to be with them. At least I'm trying. Are you crazy? Do not come. Do not come to your death, she shouted. Then I lost her voice and I lost my consciousness. The next day I called my friend who lives in the same area, asking about the situation there. She was in shock. She couldn't utter a single word. I was cursing myself for not being with them. I met up with a dear friend from Gaza who lives in the Jordanian capital Amman in order to share our news and prepare ourselves to go back home. As a way to feel our family's pain, we decided not to eat or sleep until the war came to an end or we reached home. We waited and waited and so I saw my family, along with my neighbours and relatives on TV channels. They were barefoot, hungry, shocked and traumatised. The war ended and I went back to the US, packed my luggage and got permission from the university to leave and divide my thesis in Gaza. Now I live in Gaza under siege. There is no electricity, clean water, medicine or work. Two months ago I was so depressed I made up my mind to leave Gaza in order to complete my studies or find a job. But I couldn't decide. I refuse to go through the same experience in case the war starts again, which is all too predictable. My name is Rania. I was born in Gaza in the 70s. In 1987, I got a scholarship to study in Canada. I came back to Gaza two years later to find that things had changed. It was no longer easy to travel freely from Gaza, but I got another scholarship to continue my university studies in France. I returned in 1995 with the Oslo Peace Accords when I thought that things had got better but actually they got worse. Movement between Gaza and the West Bank was no longer allowed without an Israeli permit, which was hard to get, but it was still obtainable. In 1996, I ran into my friend from high school again, and we later decided to get married. We moved to the occupied West Bank, but then with the second intifada starting in 2000, moving back and forth from Gaza became near impossible. I personally couldn't go to Gaza since then. I was at risk of being deported back to Gaza and losing my right to stay in the West Bank with my husband and children. This was a tough decision. 
It affected my career and with a degree in translation, I started a freelance business doing translation with only a dial-up internet connection at the time. It took me 10 years after I got married to be able to change my address on the ID card from Gaza to West Bank. At least now I can travel across the occupied West Bank, but I don't have access outside the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. And I definitely can't go to Gaza. I was very close to my father. He too was an interpreter. I learned so many things from him. But to my children, my father never existed. They'd never met him, he'd never come. Because he, not because he didn't want to, because he couldn't. He was denied access to the West Bank and we couldn't go to Gaza. And when he passed away, we couldn't even go to his funeral in Gaza. By then, under Israeli siege, the response we received from the Israeli authorities at the time, because I still had my Gaza ID, was, if you go to Gaza, then you're not getting out. I was to make a choice between staying with my children or going to bid farewell to my father. Obviously, as a mother, I had to choose to stay with my children. But this was one of the most brutal moments in my life. A moment I could never recover from and a moment that I will never forget. Now I have to pretend that I'm living, but in fact, with all these restrictions, I'm not. I know we're not a state. I know we're still under even more severe occupation. But the media covers only the violence. It doesn't cover the human aspect of our plight. Sometimes I think, if I go back to Gaza, what am I going back to? My family house is no longer there. My old school was shelled. Many of my friends have left. Many of my family members are no longer there. But I will still go back to the place, the place itself, the same streets I used to walk when I go to school, when I visited my friends. Why would I be denied access to Gaza? Why? I don't understand why the world keeps allowing this to happen. I think it's that people don't see that the people in Gaza aren't just numbers. They're not just two million something, they're two million souls. They were born to mothers and fathers. They were breastfed, they played. They were punished, they went to school. They failed school or they succeeded. They're just like everyone else and they should have the life that everyone else has. And although I'm still in Palestine, being cut off from the rest of Palestine makes me feel like a stranger at home. Shuna Packard provided IT for the Israeli Navy who enforced the naval blockade on Gaza, signed the pledge to boycott HP.